Great. Good, 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 good. No, okay, here we go. That's better. Good. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just waiting for us to kind of get things going here. Hi, Roman. Good to see you. Yeah, we're in now. This is great. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, good. Oh, it's just, um, I, we've been we've been looking to kind of arrange this for a while now. Uh, and uh, obviously, we should have had you in uh, last year, but things just kind of work against us sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, and we're all good tonight. And I managed to cast into the wrong place a minute ago. So, we are here, which is great. Uh, hi, Zoe. Nice to see you. Oh, people, people are coming in now, piling in. That's great to see everybody. Uh, so we've got the amazing Roman Gottfried here to speak to us tonight. Now, um, some of you might know Roman from his um, holistic dog, his own holistic dog training group. Also, you help out Linda Michaels, of course, in Do No Harm. Um, Linda's a big fan of yours, um, and, uh, and and I know you're a big fan of Linda's as well. We are uh, a family. Hi, Steph. So you know Steph, of course, Steph Sigmund. Uh, hi, hi Steph. Steph. Hi, Lainey. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Angela. Hi, Carol. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Great to see you tonight. Great. So we've got lots to unpack tonight. I just I'm going to start off by um, just giving a little bit of a potential trigger warning, really, because just by the nature of our conversation tonight, we're going to be talking a bit about trauma, talking about abuse. There's going to be some potential sharing of, of personal stories. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to give you all a heads up on that uh, this evening. So uh, hi, Diana. Nice to see you. Uh, so just to give you a, a heads up on that this evening and um, Roman, I think what would be a good place to start, you know, when, when we spoke off air before, uh, I have to say, you know, I speak to a lot of people and um, it's not about comparing or anything, but, but I was, I just came away really, uh, really fascinated by you and your story and the way that you communicate things. Uh, and it's, it was a great experience for me when we, when we had that private conversation and it came away with me thinking a, about a lot of stuff. And so a good place to start then would be about your own journey, really, because, you know, you've shared before that, um, you know, you've crossed over, you've pretty well gone through your own personal and professional evolution, really, through things. So give us an idea about your own background then, Roman, about where you kind of came into these things and what inspired you and motivated you to start thinking about what it is you were doing and how you shifted to this way of working. Hi, Linda, by the way, Linda's in the group now. Oh, yeah. Linda. Hello, everyone. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, so nice things about her. So first of all, I had a, I'm Greek Austrian, so I'm European. Um, father is Austrian, my mother is Greek. So I have this multicultures growing up. Um, unfortunately, very early family kind of fell apart. I ended up being in Iraq with my father, Saddam Hussein, back then. Things were pretty tough. And this is actually where my dog journey started. Um, I think I was um, four. I was in the house waiting for my parents to come home. And I was working with my dogs. We had a pig. We had a boar. And then we had a sheep. A saluki back then. And for some reason, a person passed by the door, opened the door, and my dog ran out in the yard. And the first thing that happened was I was shocked because somebody invaded my space, opened the door, my dog left, got hit by a car, and it was four. And the whole disaster started because I needed to do something with the dog. So technically speaking, being in a country with not knowing the language because it was Iraqish, um, I had a, a dog in my hands who was bleeding and I had to get somewhere and try to communicate. It was such a feeling of helplessness trying to communicate and not being able to communicate, trying to save my dog, and I couldn't. Well, the story goes like the dog died, of course. Um, my father wasn't happy about that. I would blame for it. And then I wasn't even allowed to bury my dog. And the whole thing starts getting that momentum that I said, I don't want to become my father. And I didn't have the tools to help my dog. I was able to call my dog back because nobody educated me how to help my dog. And I think back then, looking back, it was where I made my decision, I want to do better. So there was also parenting abuse from my stepmother. Long story short, I ended up not having dogs for many years. I ended up in boarding school. Um, that was other stories going on with abuse, neglect, molestation, sexual harassment, all these things come. And it's kind of like 
accumulation of different traumas, different versions of traumas. But back then I was just really angry. I was like the guy who would have leather jackets, tough words on it, inside totally destroyed, just making sure that everybody stays away from me. And um, I noticed that so much anger was compensated and I just took it up to the environment. Trying to avoid becoming like my parents, I become a second parent. So all this aggression that I kind of took in, I had to take out that I didn't have the right channel for it. And the interesting part was when I did end up with a dog, it was actually a cat. <laughs> I got a cat. I found a cat on the side of the streets. I took her in. It was 20 years later. But in this need to have a dog, I trained my cat. <laughs> so my cat started having a recall and she was free roaming around. She was nurtured. Um, and she become kind of like a way of communicating and start observing animals in their in their environment because back then internet was kind of dsl had to log in and blah 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 and cards were limited and it's like it wasn't as easy to get information so you have only books and i was in greece and you wouldn't get english books you get greek books and they were just miserable but one thing that i noticed is that this cat had so much potential the, the, the way she communicated, the way she tried to, to interact with me, we, we had a bond. And I recognized that I had a better bond with my cat than I had with my parents. To actually kind of start pointing in a direction, a bond is very important. And the more I bonded with my cat, the more we had this interaction. And I'm not a cat person. Okay. It was just an experience thing. Now, later on, the cat died a couple of years later, and I found a second cat. And that cat behaved exactly the same way my previous cat functioned. The same habits, the same rituals, the same invitations to jump on my bed. And I said, okay, let's try the same thing that I taught the other cat. And funny part was, even without lots of education towards the new, for the second cat, she knew already those things, which got me spooked. I was back then already looking into my religious journey. So I was Roman Catholic. And then after the molestation in the church, blah, 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 I got away from that. I've become Orthodox, which was my parent, my mother's side. And that didn't fulfill me because it was just not my spiritual direction that I wanted. Um, but then I become more into this ancient Greek philosophical aspect, um, theosophy, Pythagorean, Platonian, all this it was very interesting looking into astrosophy and more energies behind that and all of a sudden i saw a pattern on that cat that i think i have the second cat the same as the previous one so kind of like going to this reincarnation process idea what if my cat is the same energy than my previous cat and it had the same behaviors i didn't talk to those things she just knew it and from where because they were not regular cat behaviors and I was lucky next door, there was a lady with a, a Russian lady. She brought her dog me, her name was Laika. And I was had finally opportunity to test it on a dog. So I volunteered to take her dog out for walks and start playing telepathic communication between what I was trying to explain the dog and how he perceives that. I know it sounds stupid because people says, well, telepathic communications, dogs don't. But I found out they do, but I didn't have the scientific background to kind of put it in place. But that starts becoming a little bit more interesting because I recognize if you have a relationship with a dog and you speak their language and you give this broad spectrum of language, not just one thing, it's not just telepathy, it's just body language and emotions and your body language and your gestures and your structure, all these things matter. I recognize the dog was really fast speeding up in the way he was learning. I was able in a week to walk the dog off leash in Athens. Back then I was living. It's not an easy place to walk. <clears throat> and then years passed. I ended up in US by accident. And I was in, in a relationship back then. It was just a visit <laughs> kind of thing. And I was kind of suggested to apply for a visa, which I was thinking was a good idea. Why not? I was working in the industry. I was an industrial engineer having contracts with 
pharmaceuticals, with aviation, with military. And I really didn't like the direction I was going there. It was ethical, not right for me. Um, building wire machines <laughs> for rockets, killing people. I was like, I don't like that. So I quit. When I came to AS, basically it was my first attempt to kind of change industry. But the company that actually sponsored me to come over had technical issues, let's call it this way. And my visa got stuck. And my lawyer that I hired to do my visa filed it wrong. And I got stuck because A, I didn't get the visa. Plus I couldn't leave the country because I would lose my access. And I couldn't work because he didn't file for working visa either. <laughs> so I was technically speaking homeless because I was just visit. I didn't have a job. And <laughs> I was forced to wash dishes and clean offices and watering plants and serving coffees. And then I tried to have some additional work because it didn't meet ends, right? And I ended up doing dog sitting. And from dog sitting, I ended up doing dog sitting and dog training. And I got more and more involved in, in implementing my concept of anger <laughs> back then. And I was a bad trainer. I was one of those trainers you don't want to send people to because I didn't know. I thought I knew. I tried things that I saw working. It made totally sense because they were so convincing. And yes, I used the chalk color. And yes, I used the chalk color. For some reason, I, used, I didn't use a prong color because I had already the mathematical understanding of the difference between pressure and square inches. And I was very good, actually, because I implemented my technical knowledge. I could actually create one on my own, blueprints and everything and in construction. I could actually pack, package it also. And I also started reaching out to several companies because I had some ideas that I thought would work and I contacted them to apply it and they were very open to it. And then at some point applying all these things, I got a kind of a wake up experience when I got a dog who was a tripod, um, severely abused. He has basically so severely abused that his feet had to be amputated twice. And he was only seven months old. And at that point, with so much inju injuries and medications and confinement, he could become so aggressive, he was only be accessible through a drawer. So open a drawer, foot in, close the drawer, and in a three by five pen. <laughs> and he was, uh, back then, he was like a 45, 50 pound chubby Staffordshire. And there was an event back then because that shelter that the dog was there was the first non kill shelter in Long Island. So all the spotlights were there. So two famous, sorry, one famous person was invited. I was famous in the area because of my results that I had. I was very proud of it, actually. Little did I knew. And so this very famous person came to pick dogs from the shelter to save them so they don't have to be euthanized and left me with one. So they took all the creme de la creme and left me with this guy. And of course, the special people told me if I'm really sure that I want to take him because so far nobody had took him out from the kennel and I said okay well I have to leave with one and it's only one left <laughs> you guys did all the event I need to come home with something so I said yes so I got my bite suit out of the car dressed it get in and for some reason I thought I knew that dog because I work with dogs right I do everything better and for the moment, he was just looking at me, like checking me out. It was kind of like a forever second. And then he attacked. And I was like, shit, <laughs> good start. And I have to get this guy in the car. And I didn't have a crate because I was thinking they have a crate, but he didn't have a crate because he wouldn't get in the crate. So he was like a loose cannon in the car. I came home. Finally, I got him in the car with my stupid ideas how to get him in the car not happy about it but i got him home and i got him in a kennel and i was not able to get him out of the kennel because every time i opened the kennel he would attack and i used the shark collar because i thought that's the right thing to do right but then after i did not have any results with it and i was sure i would have results but i didn't 
I was under pressure because I had all my spotlights coming on to me because that's the only guy who left. And I said I could handle it, but I was on my limit of my knowledge because everything I tried didn't work. Food, nutrition, medication, any tools didn't work. He was kind of like the guy that he, he didn't care no matter how you pressure it and how much you, he would just look in your eye and just take it. And I was like, wow. So plan B, there was no plan B. But I noticed one thing, that before he attacked, I would get the sensation. It felt like a breeze. You know that somebody looks at you in the back and you turn around and you see that person watching you and you get goosebumps? That kind of feeling. And I was like, wait a minute, did that happen? So next day I paid attention to it and it did it happen. So he was staring me down and then he got the sensation and then he would attack. And I said, wait a minute, if that's a message that I'm intuitive and I can get, what if I respond to that message? Instead of pushing the button, maybe I should deliver a treat. What can I lose? It didn't work anything. So, and I did. I get that message. I give him a reward, which would stupid because people would say, what you rewarded aggression? Well, I had nothing left to think about. So I said, let's give it a shot. And guess what? He sat down and I was like, what? So I was waiting for the next signal, but it didn't came. Plus he didn't attack. So I said, maybe I should try to open the door. So my setting was I above my house and in the, in the basement was kind of the training area. <clears throat> I closed all the doors. <laughs> put my bite suit on. Okay, let's open that gate. And he came out and sat down. And I was waiting for the bite and the bite never came. And I was like, what happened? It's kind of like, you're sure you push that button to take, switch the light on and suddenly you are in a different country. <laughs> that was kind of a wake up call. And I was like, wait, so all these things that I thought would work didn't work, but that worked. So what if I apply that work for this guy on the other guys and skip the whole tool part? Because my problem was I was convinced that the tool that I was using worked for every dog and every behavior, which means no matter what. And then, of course, the other problem was if I would use a shock collar, how would I apply the collar on a dog who is aggressive if I you know, cannot get to the dog, right? So if I cannot open the kennel, how can I use the shock collar? If I cannot get to the dog, so I will use the clients to put the shock collar on. So how stupid is that? So what is what makes the client put the shock collar on? And why can I do that? Because I don't have a relationship, but my client has. And yeah. then all of a sudden, it becomes like a, <clears throat> a curtain opens up. And I saw all my mistakes coming in front of me. A, the stupid ideas that I had that things are working or not. B, how I would apply it. And B, that it works for everything and it didn't. So what is the version that works for everything? And then I start digging around and then I start remembering my trauma recovery sessions. I did uh, the Meadows program and I did all kind of sort of things from Reiki to reconnective healing. I didn't do drugs, thank God, something saved me. And I didn't drink alcohol. I was kind of safe from there. But I did smoke a lot. And I quit smoking at some point. But I recognized that everything that I did towards the dog was because of anger. Because I wanted to control that dog. Because I felt if I don't control the dog, he's going to control me. And I don't want to be controlled. So it was kind of a negative attitude to start with. Plus... That's what I was told is right to do. Mm. You have to control the beast before the beast controls you. And then I had an epiphany. It sounds like my religion that I had in the past. It needs to be controlled because you cannot be out of control. Which means like my parents did. So in, what I wanted to avoid I actually recreated and I projected onto the dogs. So if we talked up screwed up masculinity masculinity not feminine masculine but masculinity and femininity i had a totally screwed up masculinity mm -hmm. toxic 
Mm. And my femininity was down to the minimum because I didn't even trust it. Mm. So mommy trauma, daddy trauma, complex trauma, dog behavior, boom. <laughs> now that was for me the turning point that I said, how can I switch that around and make that a concept? How would I would like to feel if I would be my dog? And I'm an alien. What parts of communication do I need to start first? So the deeper you dig into that, you see more and more you're looking into trauma. So that was another kick in my butt that told me, you're not looking at a behavior. You're looking something that is beyond that, something that created it. So if I'm angry punching somebody's face, well, I didn't, but it's just an idea, then what created that? Was it because of my education? Was it because of my parents? Was it because of my environment? Was it because of my diet? Well, I have ADD. I have trauma. I was in a scrappy diet. I had anger issues. I had a bad upbringing. So the whole version was off. But I recognized because of that, I was able to see the difference. Because if you're not coming from aspect of love because you have a lack of that, then you recognize what you're missing when you have it. If you have a lack of control and then you have control, you understand the missing part of it. So those missing pieces is what actually created the holistic approach. How can I improve my dog's diet? How can I make him feel safe? How can I make him feel balanced? What is balance? What is balance? People think a balanced trainer is the one who has the balance between punishment and reward. But that's not what it is. Is yin and yang punishment and reward? It's not. Mm. It's understanding the missing pieces of it and how you can bring it into balance. So the homeostasis between what the dog needs to heal and what I need to offer him. So now I'm not looking at the behavior and look at opportunities and timing and precision and amps and milliamps and volts to control, to punish. I would see what is the emotional aspect that needs healing that I have to add and bring into surface. I have to be the grounding aspect. I have to bring the dog to that emotional level. I have to be the anchor for that dog to feel safe. If I would have a problem <clears throat> calling my parents, telling them I have a problem, I was going to yell that why I have a problem, but that doesn't help me. Mm. And that, we... yes. I was going to say, can we just pause there <clears throat> before we come on to unpacking the all the all the aspects of how you see a holistic approach to trauma? So I think it's a good place just to pause there. <clears throat> There's a couple of things I just want to say, Roman. First of all, you know, I respect and love you so much for what you shared already, right? Because I think it's it's being vulnerable is not easy sometimes, but as you've almost described there, being vulnerable is preferable to feeling vulnerable because being vulnerable is taking control from that stuff. And uh, many of us who have experienced trauma ourselves and been through things, and I have been that guy who took drugs. That was one of my things back in the time before my breakdown, which was the best thing that ever happened to me, actually, uh, to look at these things. But we all kind of find our way through with these things. And this is such a beautifully rich story that you've shared with us i just wanted to say thank you for that and uh you know looking at the comments in the group people are really inspired and humbled by by you sharing it and i think what we can see here actually is a powerful representation of what we're thinking about now because your own trauma your own lack of secure attachment when you were younger created an outlook and I, and I do wonder you know putting my human psychology on whether this is why you end up doing things like the engineering and that kind of thing something that's practical something that is external something that has to make sense of stuff and it's interesting right. that you mentioned about the cats right because you almost needed the cats first right you needed the cats to for you to be open to the cat maybe with the dog you wouldn't have been open to the dog but to the cat you were right and to have that one dog then where your own I th and I look at a lot of people who seek to control the behavior of another we can easily demonize them but often they're just a victim of their own trauma that has made them think 
I need to control in order to feel safe. That dog looked you in the eye and said, we need to work something different out here. And, and it's just powerful. I'm goosebumpy thinking about it, actually, Roman. So thank you big time. Uh, and I think uh, and it shows you know, when you when I put my little post up about watching some of the kind of more aversive trainers and, and making this thing about the, the flip between task and care and how they're just really into task. And you shared in that about I've been there. I've been that task guy and I have found my way through to care. What an amazing, what was that dog's name, by the way, Rome? Ziggy. Ziggy. So, Sigmund. Sigmund, because I knew Sigmund Freud has something to tell me about it. So I call yeah. him Ziggy just to remind myself of what I'm working on. His previous name was um, not Titan, something weird, didn't match him. Something very butch by the sound of it. Something very yeah, nasty. something bold, like bully bold <laughs> right so thank god for ziggy uh uh for sure and uh, so this has opened up a great conversation now then because your own brain was opened up to what the more might be for the individual what different component parts because what actually you were seeking all that time really was a notion of your own personal attempts to find emotional safety of your own and and how we provide that to another and I think also this um you talked early on about having that feeling that sensation and I think everybody has their own view on these things but I think we can dismiss that type of thing too readily actually there are elements here where we can create quite deep connections with another that transcends what science can maybe tell us about that just on a purely neurobiological level I think I think that's important mm -hmm. So let's talk about the holistic approach. Let's start by maybe framing what you would like to define as holistic. I think that's a great place because I, I know some people roll their eyes when they hear that word, but it's important <laughs> and, it, and it means something and it's actually bedded in deep richness, actually. Uh, and it's an important word. So let's start with there and then let's, bore, um, let's, uh, let's build on the way that you do things then, Roman, and your approach to especially helping very vulnerable dogs. Yeah, well, it's funny because I remember back then when I turned the switching point and I said, I have to do it differently. People called me a woo-woo trainer because I used Reiki and oops, whatever. Anyway, basically, I struggle with my title holistic dog training because it's not training anymore. It's basically parent. And the concept of parenting is what actually is the dynamic of looking away from just controlling the dog into training, 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 and to step into your parenting power and see that as how can I be a holistic parent and creating a positive and supportive environment for my dog and emphasis on building a strong and secure attachment between the dog and the guardian or parent, whatever you want to call it. And I know some people kind of are difficult to breathe through the word parenting a dog but in reality parenting is bringing support to an individual that cannot care for himself so we can parent our parents right if we can parent our parents we can parent anything that needs our care that cannot provide for himself so dog can be part of parenting which means you have to come with the principle of do not harm linda thank you for putting that name out and putting the emotional and physical well-being as priority because that's what parenting is it's not that I'm being selfish anything's about me looking at my parents but what's in for my dog and how can I provide for my dog to go through the whole process so his needs are met and as a person whose needs weren't met I know how difficult it is to become who I am if I don't have those space to step on. And it's a privilege at some point to have this access. So you have to work hard for it, but it should not be so hard to work on. You should become natural. Nature is plenty. There's an abundance of things. You don't have to work hard to drink water. You just have to find the water. You just have to have access to it. And if we look into nature, this is how dogs educate their siblings and their, their dogs they show them they don't punish them they don't reward them 
it's a vicious, or not a vicious, a good circle of I parent you to become better by showing you what I know so you can do it better. And it's, I, I think people get also confused that evolution is one after the other. It's flexible. Genetics are flexible. And I'm sorry, people who think that genetics are fixed and once it's there, it doesn't change. Genetic changes and improves as it happens, as our emotions come up, as our experience come in, as I push the button, it doesn't work, as I fall down and hit myself, all these things are adjusting. And I think that's the parenting power, giving the dog that opportunity to evolve, not only physical, right, but also spiritual and emotional. So that is the package. And also take in consideration the dog's previous time. So we have a time factor before, now, and in the future. So I want to know what happened to my dog and what his needs are because his behavior that shows me that something didn't work, can I recreate it? Can I find out what didn't work? So taking in consideration my own experience, somebody like you who has experience with psychology, you can find out because of my behavior, which pieces of my social behavior was missing and my parenting parts were missing and my nutritional was missing. And now you say, oh, that's why he's behaving like that. And so we can take that in consideration on a dog. So I added a trauma-informed, secure attachment-based system. So I cannot just treat a dog without being aware of his trauma, which can be pre-birth. So a parent who was born in a breeding meal and give birth to a puppy in a breeding meal, the genetic information of trauma comes down to the generation up to 17 generations we know of. Particular dogs, we don't know. But in Greece, we have a saying. Past, per, past, Amartyas Goneon Pedevus in parents' undone things affect children. And I'm like, wait, so if my parents didn't have a healing process, it transferred back to me so I can heal it. So if a dog is going through a healing process and his parents weren't able to heal it, we're going to transfer that to the puppy. So we have a genetic, a generational healing process happening of a trauma that we humans did to dogs, putting them in fighting pits and shelters and breeding facilities and pet care that we call it. And that is a dynamic that we shouldn't forget. So the first thing I think is the dog has trauma. There's no way a dog doesn't have trauma unless I found a dog in nature and we hang out, you know, snacking on sticks. Until then, I don't know until I find out. So I assume the dog has trauma who's a pet because it's being removed from his family. We don't know the breeding practices of the previous owner. They are practices that you don't want to know that happens to dogs to be mated with other dogs it's called breeding horse so that dog already comes with aggression down the generation he's afraid of other dogs because of that and i need to know that as especially as professional so all these things go as a package into that holistic system so i need to see the trauma i need to see the relationship and then i have the physical part well nutrition fresh water, accessibility, environmental factors that are physically important, a bed, a safe house. And I know people says, well, you know, dogs have lived all the time outside. Yes, they had the freedom to move as the pets, they don't. So I have to cover that part too. My dog should be free to move in this tiny environment that he has that I created for my dog because of convenience at some point, because of financial struggles at some point, I want my dog to have as much freedom as possible, but that's how much I can have for him to be safe in that environment that I live. It doesn't make me an abuser. Does it help the dog? Well, it's not the best option for the dog. I think a free dog is a free dog, not a dog who runs free in the house. And I feel a dog who is outside in the wild running around like a free roaming dog has less trauma, even if he's missing a leg, then a dog who is a pet in the house who's missing a tail and we need to become aware of that and so i'm encouraging people to focus on the wellness and healing aspect rather than control 
and petting. So traditionally child care, child care, traditional pet care, on the other end, is based on the belief that the owner is the pack leader. Dogs are packs. So I'm the pack leader because I took over that pack. Now it's mine. I do whatever I want with it. And they're not to comply with me. So we have commands. We have dominance training. We have punishment-based methods. We basically accuse the dog to be wrong and find a good opportunity and a good timing to make him known that he was wrong. Like my parents did to me, try to find out when I was wrong, right? But I never knew what's right because I was always wrong. So I found out by making mistakes gets attention. So I've got negative attention, making more mistakes, getting more attention from my parents. Perfect. That works too. <laughs> and once we see that, then we recognize that the relationship between the dog and its owner, it's often power struggle. It's a based on conflict. The dog wants to get away with it and I need to punish him because that's what he do. Because if I don't punish him, it's going to take over my family. It's going to take over my power. And then I'm a loser because I'm not a power person. And my wife, of course, wouldn't take that big dog because she's a woman. So we have so much sexism in the dog training part. Like a woman cannot have a big dog and a man cannot, a male cannot have a chihuahua because of that wrong idea, who does what and why and with what force. It's of force related. And I said, we can pull back from that. It's not power game. It's not a force game. It's a relationship team. It's way more powerful. And then I had a conversation the other day with a friend of mine. I helped him remember who was your best teacher in school? Which one have you learned more from? And never ever have heard from a person who told me, oh, that guy was really tough to me and he was punishing me and I got have to stand hours up on the wall. I don't even remember even his name, but I remember the nice guy who helped me a lot and helped me go over my problems and was appreciated and was empathetic and sympathetic to my problems. And hey, gave me a day off because I felt miserable. That's the guy I will remember. That's my pack leader, if you want to call it. And the other one is just an abuser, even if he doesn't feel like that. So we see abuse only if we feel it. We don't see it if the other one sees feeling it. And that's a really good point because <clears throat> there is a huge difference between what we're taught and what we actually learn. So those teachers who, um, when I had my own trauma event as a child and uh, I, I couldn't share that with my parents I, I didn't tell anybody but it affected my behavior or some of my school teachers who were very much into you must behave a certain way when I wasn't that's when I got the cane that's when I got the slipper because you could back then in the UK so they felt that they were teaching me a lesson and they were because you know I think one the one time uh, I'd gone to school without my gym kit. It was something as simple as that because my head was all over the place because of the trauma I'd experienced. And I was given the given the slipper and the, the PE teacher used to draw a union flag on with chalk. So when he whacked your hand with the slipper, which is a, which is a pump, really, it's a pump, you'd have it on there. Uh, so the lesson there for him that he thought he taught me was don't forget your gym bag, which is what I definitely did. But what I learned was... Don't forget the sleeper. I can't, I can't be vulnerable. I can't feel safe. I can't, all the kind of things that we learn. So you're absolutely right. And I think uh, that connection, especially when we're younger, to finding and seeking social and emotional safety is a powerful one. Those people that we feel heard by. And you're right. I think there's, there's a lot of damaging stuff. That a lot of this is connected when we think about back in the day, that notion of children should be seen and not heard. Women should be seen, not heard, whatever it is. We've kind of ended up with dogs should be seen, not heard. And what that really means is, is uh, that kind of mindset is you're allowed to feel what you like, but just don't show it. You're allowed to feel however you need to, but just but I need you to behave the way I perceive. Uh, and quite often that's because that other has a version of the world that they want everybody to comply to um uh but that creates a huge amount of trauma for the other especially not only behavior as an expression of need that we talk about a lot but for me as uh, a big one especially being a young gay man growing up before i came out and all the kind of stresses of that this notion of not being able to see behavior as an expression of self even you know that that ability to feel safe when we think about emotional safety as 
um, openness and trust in a relationship. That's huge, isn't it, Ronan, when you think about it? Uh, and how much do we take that away from our relationship with dogs when a lot of what the traditional way of looking at things, regardless of methods, actually, is about compliance? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. And I can officially apologize for not giving you that room of being free how you want to be because back then in school we had children who were gay but we were bullying them because we didn't know better we thought it's a choice wearing penitent and because it was just not an expression for us it was just he wanted to be different right it was his choice to be different we didn't think of their feelings because that's how narrow-minded I am or was back then. And my apologies for you not having that freedom. Well, you don't have to apologize on the person, you know, but, I think, but when we think about it though, let's just think about it. There's this sweet spot when we're young where our comparative brain is working in a very um, advantageous way. And that actually we don't see others based on sex, color, creed, sexuality. We just see things around safety and wanting to find safe social connection but then we're fed the information of other people's beliefs and value systems religion our parents this notion that they're different they're different and because that comparative brain then starts to connect to this notion of well i need to be the, the majority i need to be the one that isn't different that's where a lot of this stuff comes from Roman. and we're all kind of victim to that really because we're all indoctrinated through that uh, and it doesn't help because the powers that be like that, mm -hmm. because if we're looking, if I'm looking at you because you're different and you're somehow the, the person I've got to fear, I'm not fearing them. Right. So it's best, really. So, so young Roman, who himself was already in that place of experiencing your own need for safety and, and, and struggling to find those secure attachments, you've been fed this information that maybe that person there is somebody that you can offload onto and a lot of actual when uh, i remember in my human therapy uh, times when uh working with somebody who'd been um convicted of cruelty to animals listening to his full story here's somebody who'd experienced um abuse from both parents uh abuse uh as in bullying like severe physical bullying from both of his older brothers and it's just that hierarchy, isn't it, of like, okay, the cat is something I can take that anger out because that's what you're talking about at the top of the hour, really. And it's not about making excuses. It's just trying to understand the frailty of the human condition when we're, you know, when we don't feel safe uh, and where that, how that manifests. Right. But if, if we take that concept and we bring it down to the dogs, we see yeah. that we have the same concept there too. We see a bully breed, it's a bully breed. It comes in that cast. And even if that dog is not a bully breed, it's just his person, his own individuality. Yes, in that frame of behaves a certain way that breed behaves, but that's a very small prospect. The reality is that dog is working in that range of the breed traits, like a child of a police officer and a nurse, will not behave like a police officer or a nurse, but he will behave like service to others. That's the essence of it. Now that can be that he can be a mob and a service to his own gang. Now, it doesn't have to be a police officer or a nurse, it can be a fireman, but it's service to others. So when we take the breed traits, we don't have to see the breed and then forcing the breed into the breed box because I have a boxer and I have to treat him like a boxer and I have a bully breed. I have to treat him like a bully breed and I have a pit bull or a Staffordshire. I have to treat him like a Staffordshire if he is not. That makes sense. It does. And that's really interesting because if you treat that child because you've already decided they're disruptive, they're nuisance, they're, they're wrong, they're whatever, they're going to start having those aspects to them. You know, my husband's uh a nurse and uh, sometimes they'll get a patient in and on the form somebody else has said this patient is aggressive this patient is difficult this patient is challenging it's amazing how some 
other healthcare workers will look at that and then treat them like that thing. Oh, he's going to be trouble. Whereas right, right. Kieran looks at that and he thinks, right, why are they difficult? Why are they challenging? Why are they being aggressive? And often it's because their own care needs are not being met and they're not being heard. And that's the same for a dog, right? Especially those ones that we class as aggressive, that are a term that you and I both don't like because it doesn't right. tell us much um, because we can easily think this dog's aggressive. Therefore, we must treat them like this. I fell in the same trap because I was working with dogs over 100 pounds. Like my smallest dogs will be a bull mastiff kind of size. And my concept was, well, big dogs need heavy hands. And, you know, if you don't control them now, they're going to take over later. Which means if I would be a child that's overweight or a little bit taller, you have to treat me differently like a child that's a little bit smaller and less have less weight. Is that how we work around? And I was the one who said, well, big dog has to be more controlled. In reality, it's not the size or the breed that makes the dog who he is. It makes his environmental factors. So while science says, well, between 30 and 60% is what the genetics affect the dog, I would say, I wouldn't put a number on it. It's a sliding scale. It depends on each individual dog. You cannot make it up and before. You can see it as it happens. Because the more trauma the dog has, the more he's affected by, emotion, by environmental triggers, and the less is the genetics that makes, but the genetics can hit him on the worst place. If he has a genetic predisposition to bite to survive, he's going to use it. Can he yeah. avoid it? No, he can't. But a dog who doesn't have trauma and has education and has morals and ethics in place because of his proper parenting upraising, because he grew up with his parents and morals and ethics already educated into it, the dog would choose not to and rather walk away from it. So my approach would be at that point, recognizing the trauma, the problem case and try to help the dog create a new start because I'm going back to the genetics and say over thousands of years and from my belief system, science is kind of coming close. At least 150,000 years, we have human dog relationships. If I would be me, I would say 1.5 million years in human dog evolution call it whatever species that was back then but we were walking together so there's a genetic information in the dog that tells me being with people is beneficial how do i get this guy to do what i need him to do and we evolve together and i don't think that humans domesticated dogs i think we both domesticated each other which means we're not on top of the hierarchy, we're next to each other. And I think we wouldn't be where we are right now if dogs wouldn't have already pre-organized groups that were functioning. And we says, well, they're funding in groups, we should do it too. How about we join powers? We can predict, we have ideas, we have hope, dogs don't. And how about we put this together? We hope the animal comes here and we come here and wait for them. And the dog is like, what are you waiting for? There's nothing here. But I prayed for it. And the dog is like, damn, you were right. I don't know how you did it. You showed up with food. Awesome. We stay here. But that we take in consideration. If that is a genetic information, then I can re-trigger it by behaving a certain way where the genetic says, oh, that feels safe. Feels like home. Feels like my parents. So I will be a surrogate parent, a proxy. And that can trigger the whole event to restart like doing floating in a water bath where you suddenly hear nothing and then you hear a lot and so we're triggering that and start the secure attachment relationship from scratch and teach the dog what's possible so his genetic feels safe that can do the restart and then we have so many things that we can add to the equation that we use already for children we have science behind that for children. Mm -hmm. So if we compare and we know already that dogs and children have similar emotional level, and I would say dogs are emotionally intelligent and we can say dogs are intuitive in a certain level. Yes, they can predict when you're coming home. I have seen often my wife calling me, where are you? Because the dog is at the door. It's like I'm 20 minutes away every time, right? And the dog has no clue where I am, what time I'm coming back. We can take that 
and put it together and say, if children nonverbal feel a certain way and we can communicate a certain way, and because the children have the same emotions, the same process as the dogs, removing the ego from the equation. So we talk about everything minus ego, everything underneath is basically copy paste. So technically speaking, I can take any child book that's under a certain age, change child with dog and have the same answer. Yeah. But we have to get out of the taboo because we cannot say that. We cannot say dogs equals children. No, we cannot. But I th I say we can think about it. We don't have to say it. We can think about it and let it sit a little bit. Let it brew a little bit. Let's see what comes up to surface. Let's see. If I would do that to a child, would it feel good? And what if I take that and do it to a dog? How would it feel like? So mm. I may not get the answer yes or no from a dog, which I do, but nobody pays attention to it. I can get kind of a feeling about it, taking that into consideration. If a dog with trauma would feel better if I feed him four times a day versus twice a day, I know from children, if they have trauma, feeding him more often feels more safe. If I apply it, I may see results. If I feed healthy food to a child with ADD, it thinks better. Maybe I can try that with a dog who is on crappy food. Maybe he can think better if he's on healthy food. So that's the holistic approach. It's not just driving a Prius and being vegetarian <laughs> or say OM before every session. It's mm. seeing the whole picture. And waiting for that feedback from the other. Being right. available with quality presence to that. I think that's a really important thing. And that thing you were saying about it's kind of everything removing ego is really important because it's the ego that makes us sometimes perceive things that we're thinking, oh, yeah, that's fitting my narrative now without necessarily thinking about what the effects are for the other. And I love this notion of the triggering of safety, Roman. What an awesome thing to think about. When you think about all the stuff we know from a neurobiological point of view about the, the drive when we're younger and more vulnerable to seek safe social connection, because actually when we think about even something like the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's and Linda's amazing hierarchy of dog needs, when we think about that very young brain, the social bit actually would probably be on the bottom in some ways because you can't get food, shelter, unless you can appeal to another, I want to be with you so you can provide, you know? Right, right. So actually for these dogs who've experienced this trauma, they do have the network there to want to seek safety. And, and uh, you've explained earlier at the top of the hour that are many people who have experienced trauma and have been traumatized through that it's very easy to create these barriers then uh, as kind of coping mechanisms, but underneath it, deep down, we want to reconnect again. We want to find that safety reconnect, which can be challenging, especially as we get older, of course, and we, and we put up more barriers. But so that triggering of safety for the dogs is a powerful thing. And we see it. We just do. We see it. Um, what, uh, we're, I can't believe it, Roman, we've gone around the air. I think it'd be great to get you back if you'd like to come back and talk again so we can uh, maybe uh, share uh, maybe share a couple of case studies or something so people can unpack mm -hmm. this. But before we kind of um, finish up, uh, what what is your kind of, what would you really like to share with the group regarding something for them to take away that they can think about almost practically really regarding their own relationship with their dogs? Well, first of all, let's touch the spiritual aspect of it mm -hmm. because I feel all of us who have dogs and feel inclined to dogs and feel attracted to dogs and want to be with dogs, there's something in our energy, in our spirit that wants to help it. I think we should stay focused on why are we here to do? You, me, Linda, Elizabeth, John, Frank, whoever does something around dogs, who says, I have something to share. Why do you have something to share? What makes you feel that you have something to share? And what's the quality of what it is? How does it benefit dogs? No matter how you feel about it, I know people who feel using certain tools 
that's the right thing to do and other people think these are the tools whatever you do i would like to think about it focus on the end goal don't jump off the plane because you saw clouds at some point something in you when you connect with your higher self it gets that message do it better and then you have to make a choice either or we have to have a healthy moral compass to make that choice when i made the choice to look away from the aversive tools i had to go through shame i was shaming myself but i was shamed too and then you have to stick to your plane and keep flying and not getting off that plane it's easy to be diverted and do something else oh yeah you know i i have to keep it secret and then just divert around it's not getting you anywhere if you're not passionate of what you're doing no matter what you do it's not gonna work and so on the other hand i see balanced trainers and aversive trainers they are passionate about what they do you can't even blame them but what they do so much passion it gets a dynamic it gets some followers it gets some power it gets the money they just go somewhere because they're passionate so my my message here is don't look around in our neighbor's yard don't jump off your plane put that passion put in your target help your dog and your dog will help you get there it's important to have this communication because dogs have a higher self and we have a higher self and we both are here because we're working on a collective we work on a collective healing dogs collective needs to be healed from our atrocities that we have in the past and i'm sorry if i use the word wrong and we have to heal so i think at some point there is not a contract an arrangement between the dog collective and the human collective to help us as we always did heal from point a to point b but we have to come through the shame and says i did wrong in the past and i want to make it good without being stupid and I love this notion of collective healing. And I think looking at the room, I think we've all had a bit of collective healing in this room, in this chat today. Because one of the things I think about this notion of connecting to that higher self is, is being humble and, and, and giving ourselves grace, actually, and being vulnerable, because that's the antidote to shame, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable and share with myself and others that, yeah, that was my story. And this is, I'm not going to be defined by that. I'm going to be defined how I grow. Uh, and that's uh, a really powerful message for us to, to end on. And I think if we can start with ourselves in this process and have, God, anybody in the room, I'm sure many of you are going to really kind of resonate with this because I hear it all the time. When we do allow ourselves to connect beyond ego to another, especially to those wonderful dogs that come into our lives, boy, do we grow right and that that kind of humility is what keeps us growing and not being stuck doing the same thing for 20 years right i think that's yeah. really important well okay romans so we're going to make sure that um there's some great comments in the group have a little look later on uh if you get a mo and we'll definitely um uh if you could just ping me over the links that you want me to share but where's the best place that people can get more roman well <laughs> i think more of me is in you so but if you want to learn a little bit more what I do and how I do it, holisticdogtraining.org is my website. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, Holistic Dog Training, and there's a lot of free content and some ideas. You can see the evolution where I started and how I ended. Um, but I feel if you want to reach deeper and kind of learn how to be your parent for your dog, and try the holistic approach, see that coming from a different perspective. I do have individual classes for individual people, for the individual families, having individual dogs. So I have this secure attachment training sessions uh, or training packages where we walk through a whole process of healing behavior. And then I have a, a more advanced behavior healing program where we're going through using the dog and you as a healing partner and going through a synergistic healing process while we're addressing aggressive behaviors. So I don't see aggressive behavior has to be punished, controlled, click and trained, or just reward, or just punished, or just closed out. 
I see that a healing process, you are part of it. The dog doesn't do this for no reason. You didn't choose that dog for no reason. Everything is interconnected. So we looked at in this in the system, in the healing process, and we tap into spirituality. And I have some systems there where we help the person who is in the healing process tap into the dog's frequency and energy and see how does trauma look like in a physical body, looking at it from a spiritual aspect, and then how can we heal it out? Um, yeah, that's pretty much. It. That sounds amazing, and. Uh... You know, uh, we'll make sure we share those links uh, both in the group and uh, make sure you share whatever you want to in Dog Center to Care. Uh, you know, it's, an, it's an open thing because uh, I really appreciate you, Roman, uh, Roman, and I really appreciate you being here with us tonight as well. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, great, brilliant conversation tonight. That was great. Um, uh, I want to say next... a small thank you at the end. Sorry, Dan? I want to say a small thank you at the end before you close. Uh, yeah, great. I've just got one more quick thing to say. Um, two things, actually. So uh, the, the 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 chosen rescue for this month, uh, which I, I've, I've set up these rescues each month now, Roman, for anybody who wants to kind of um, uh, contribute uh, or donate. Uh, it's the Bedlington Terrier Rescue. We've got uh, Kay Scott, who does amazing things with their foster program. She's going to come in just like Andrew Curtis did last night. Uh, so that, look out for that. Our next conversation in the in the group, I think it's next week. I have to keep reminding myself. Oh, yeah, so it's next Friday. This is a good one. So Victoria Stillwell um, uh, is going to come and speak to us, which is amazing because, uh, you know, I really appreciate a lot of things that Victoria's done. And I know Victoria quite well. And uh, I think if a lot of people think they know her from the telly, but there's way more there to Victoria for sure. Uh, and she doesn't do a lot of these things. So it's great to have her come and have a chat with us in the group, which is going to be great. So tune into that. Uh, and over to you, Roman. Thank you by the way, again, uh, for coming in tonight. Thank you. My big thank you to Linda and a big thank you to you, Andrew. Um, I think we are a family, a spiritual family, that our, our goal is to make things better for dogs. And I think we should stick together as family, no matter how some family members getting off the path, try to build bridges and stuff. Let's stick together. That's a great thing to end on family i think we are and we're all doing our best here it's difficult sometimes it's challenging and uh well thank you uh roman thank you so much thank you everybody in the group uh really great comments in the group tonight and uh whatever you're doing this afternoon this morning this evening depending on where you are in the world um thank you for uh tuning in and look after yourselves and please take care and we'll see you soon thanks roman bye-bye thank you